Good afternoon. I'm Byron Johnson. I direct the Institute for Studies of Religion here at Baylor University. Uh, we're delighted today to have Paul Marshall with us. Paul is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C. It's a think tank. He's been there for many years. Paul's a, an internationally acclaimed scholar. He's written many, many books. Um, uh, his research primarily centers on religious freedom. And uh, his most recent work is in the area of Indonesia. And that's what he'll be talking about today. Paul has, as I said, written 20 books. I had all this written down, but I left my uh, paperwork in the office as I was talking to Paul. And he is a senior fellow here also at ISR. And uh, did his PhD at York University in political science. And he did uh, additional graduate work in theology at Oxford. He's been a longtime friend, and um, we're really excited to have him here with us today to uh, give this lecture. So, Paul Marsh. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Byron. It's very good to be here at Baylor uh, in Waco and in Texas. I have a longtime association with Texas. I moved to Washington, D.C. in 1998. And in Washington, uh, uh, two major cultural events. One is, of course, the White House Correspondents' Dinner, usually known as Hollywood for Ugly People. <laughs> and the other is the presidential inaugural balls. And um, usually try to go to those and uh, every time a new president is elected. And the key one you want to get to is the, these are organized by the states, is the inaugural ball of the state from who, where the president has come. So in the year 2000, that was George W. Bush. And so it was the Texas State Ball that you wished the black tie and boots, a ball that you wanted to uh, get to. Uh, but those are, could be hard tickets. So I was advised by longtime friends is priority for tickets to a state ball are given by the state society, in this case, the Texas State Society. So if you become a member of the Texas State Society, you stand a good chance of getting tickets. So I said, OK, what are the qualifications? Well, you're supposed to be from Texas. I said, OK, I'll try and adjust my accent. Um, but they were very nice, and I, I called and said, I'd like to join the Texas State Society. He says, OK, name, address, email address, and so on. And then they said, what, what's your connection with Texas? And I said, I really like Texas. <laughs> and she says, that's good enough for us. So I became a member, <laughs> So, which gave me even more reason to like Texas. So this afternoon, um, I want to talk about two things. Um, in effect, almost two lectures. Um, but one reflects on the other, so they tie together. Uh, first thing I want to do is give an overview, particularly an overview of conflict between Christians and Muslims, or between Christendom and probably we should say Islamdom, uh, over the last 1400 years. Okay, so I'm going to cover 1400 years of world history in <laughs> approximately 15 minutes, which means that I will miss certain things. We'll occasionally lack nuance, and I will tend to generalize. But I, I'm, after, I'm after looking at the sweep of things. And against that background, I um, want to talk about the importance of Indonesia, where I'm doing most of my work right now, and what that work is, and why, it, why it's important. But first, let's, um, OK. Um, as you know, Muhammad is reputed to have been born in the area of uh, Mecca, around here, in the year 570, uh, dying in, in 632. Uh, the dark purple you'll see here is land that was in the, I'll say, kingdom that he controlled at the time of his death. So in a period of about 10 years, he and his Arab Muslim followers controlled this area. If we move ahead to 29 years later, we go to the middle purple, and the Arab Muslims controlled 
this area. Move ahead to 750, and we can also take in Spain into southern France, off to Central Asia with the borders of China on the Talus River, and also into India. What was missed is there was, of course, also an expansion here, almost the banks of the Loire River to Poitiers. So 100 years after Muhammad's death, there were Arab Muslim armies 150 miles south of Paris and in western China, and controlling a very large swathe of, of things in between. I don't want to say anything about this at the moment, except it was a major achievement. It was, of course, empire building. But if the Byzantines sent it here could have done it, they would. If the Persians, who got defeated, could have done it, they would. That's what, that's what empires did. Uh, so in that sense, the Muslim expansion was not different, just highly successful. In 100 years, uh, establishing a major world empire. So what this means is that Islam, as its beginning, Muhammad was successful as a ruler, as a military leader, as a religious teacher. And Muslims were similarly successful in the um, expansion. There were also, this hundred years after that, there were repeated sieges against Constantinople. Here, as you probably uh, know, chunks of Rome were, uh, were burned by Arab invaders in, I think it was 846. So there was continual expansion out of the Arabian Peninsula here. Uh, this continued. Uh, this is a map in 1100. I couldn't find a set of maps which had all of them in the same format, I'm afraid. But I shifted. Um, so we're looking now at approximately 350 years later, the pushback in Spain, the Reconquista. A slight move here in Turkey, but still the Byzantine Empire holds them back. But now major expansion across the Sahara to uh, the southern borders of the, uh, the Sahara, the edge of the Sahel, right down uh, the eastern coast of Africa to uh, what is now Mozambique, even to South Africa, uh, of course Madagascar, uh, more expansion into Central Asia, and then right down the Indus Valley, controlling most of uh, northern India. Uh, we move ahead to the uh, 1500. Um, what has happened now? Constantinople has, uh, has fallen. It falls to the Ottoman Turks. And in 1453, um, it is taken over. Over here, there's a pushback out of Spain. Uh, the Moors are expelled from Spain. But almost everywhere else, expansion. Now we go into Eastern Europe, as far as Vienna, twice but controlling uh, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Serbia, chunks of Austria, um, up north into Ukraine, and then a major expansion into what is now um, Russia, at one point even reaching the shores of the, of the Baltic, and incidentally uh, also raiding the coasts of Iceland in 625. And then um, move into Central Asia, now controlling most of the Indian subcontinent, going through what is now Bangladesh, Burma, into southern China, and then uh, taking over um, Indonesia and Malaysia. A slight error in the map, it should include the southern Philippines here. Uh, the expansion from 1100 onwards through these areas was largely peaceful. The conquest was mainly this area, the area we tend to call the uh, now the greater uh, Middle East. So here you're looking at a major expansion. Uh, switching a map, these, this is a map of the areas at one time or another under Muslim rule. That is, the rulers were Muslim. The population may or may not have been majority Muslim. So consider this. You know, Muhammad dies 632. Uh, we're looking almost exactly 1,000 years later. Uh, the Muslim world is militarily successful. If it were 
it was never one political unit, but if, you, if it was a political unit, it would be the largest empire in world history. Um, it was successful in terms of trade. If the Europeans wanted to deal with uh, the East, uh, which they did, they had to sail it around it. That's why the Portuguese were doing this. That's why Columbus was going. It wasn't just to find the Indies, but it was trying to find a way to trade with the Indies without having to go through all of this. Uh, culturally important in terms of literature, philosophy, it produced many wonderful things. The architecture was good. And so for 1,000 years, if you were a Muslim, your religion was a success. There is notions of failure and suffering and martyrdom in Islam, but more so, I think, more so than in Christianity, uh, the idea that you would win, you would be victorious, you would be successful is far stronger. And in this setting, the external world reinforces your conviction that your religion is the truth. Why? Because you're rich, successful, and powerful, and your teaching has spread throughout the world and is continuing to spread. The world is unfolding um, as it should. There have been a few setbacks. One of the things we tend to talk about now, but nobody did then, was the Crusades, which you may have noticed don't appear on any of these maps because, to quote Bernard Lewis, it was a um, short, failed uh, counterattack by European Christians, um, which ended in loss. So the the Muslims at the time didn't think too much about it. Their big issue, of course, was the Muslims, as that was the Mongols, who killed more people on one weekend in Baghdad than the Crusaders did in 200 years. But anyway, here's this expansion. The world is as it should be. And then it changes. It doesn't change quickly. As you know, history doesn't immediately turn around and go in another direction. Uh, but what would be happening is, instead of winning most battles and losing some, you started to lose more. And then slowly you started to lose more battles than you won, and you were starting to shrink. And so there's reversal in the fortunes of Islamdom. And it's hard, you couldn't really put a date on it, it's a you know, three or four century reversal. But um, if ever tempted to um, put a date on it, um, I would always pick September the 11th, 1683, um, which was the, because on September the 12th was the failure of the second Ottoman Turkish siege of Vienna. So the September 11th could be taken as the high water mark. The other reason I pick it is because now you will all remember September the 11th. So it's um, a memory device. So there was a defeat there. To some degree, the, the, the Ottomans had been defeated or at least withdrawn from Vienna in, I think, 1525. Um, but this was different. It wasn't just you lost one. After this point, the Ottomans were pushed back. They were driven out of Austria. They were driven out of Hungary, um, out of what is now Serbia, then through Romania. They were also being uh, pushed back by the Russians, and this has now disappeared, in, um, in, 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 in uh, around the Ukraine, southern Russia, and then through um, Central Asia. And that retreat kept going. So the first stage was this, that um, the Europeans, Western Europeans, in this context, the Christians, started reconquering their own land. Most of these areas would still be majority Christian. And driving out Muslim rulers uh, from Europe, both from the West, in Spain, uh, right through to the Caucasus, and now in the Baltics. So a pushback from the Europeans. Uh, so that was a series of defeats, but that wasn't really um, the worst problem, is that the is Christians didn't stop there. You remember this map from 1500, so sort of again, near the high water of, Ottoman, of, of Muslim expansion. 
Well, I mentioned the European uh, voyages of discovery going down the coast here. Portuguese had already done this, and then going under here and getting off to um, the eastern areas. Well, of course, the Europeans just didn't discover. They started to take over things. And one of them was, uh, well, let's just take a few examples. The British take over uh, India, including now what is Pakistan, and uh, Bangladesh, and parts of Burma, the British Raj. Who do they take it over from? Well, there's Hindu kingdoms in the south, but mainly from Muslim rulers. British take over Malaysia. From who? Muslim rulers. The Dutch take over Indonesia. Who? From Muslims. Uh, in Africa, down the east coast, and for much of the west coast, who is this being taken from? From Muslims. So firstly, you have defeat in Europe. Now you're getting defeat in the not, obviously not peripheral areas if you live in them, but the areas outside the greater Middle East where there are Muslims and majority Muslims, Christians are now, for the first time in history, conquering them. Uh, again, the Russians do a similar thing throughout um, Asia. Then things get even worse. Um, just another one, the Ottoman Empire, which I've mentioned again here, you need to look at um, the dark brown and the light brown. The Ottoman Empire in 1683, when they were de defeated just outside of Vienna, the sort of light brown includes what the Ottoman Empire is then. Beginning of Second World War, just this brown area. So uh, the loss of uh, Ukraine, sections of Russia, and uh, of course the Baltics, then North Africa. Um, the, Fre the French and the Spaniards and others start to take over this area. And then uh, Napoleon, of course, invades Egypt 1798. The British defeat him because the Egyptians can't. And the British, as was their habit, hung around for 150 years. Always promised to leave in 20 years was the, uh, was the motto used there. So you get the tremendous shrinkage of the major Muslim empire, the Ottomans as well, in your home territory. And then that leads to this at the uh, end of the uh, First World War. Uh, these are the Muslim countries which could nominally be considered independent. Um, there is Egypt, but it's still, a, it's still a British protectorate. Uh, these areas controlled by the British and the French. Um, then if you take two of the big ones, Turkey and uh, Persia, that is Iran, these are largely secular in outlook. They're not, their rulers are nominally Muslims, but not substantively so, so they tend to be apostate. And of course, uh, Turkey is run by Ataturk. Um, who gets rid of the Arabic language and many other things and, in, and then abolishes the, uh, the caliphate, the nominal ruler of all of the Muslims. So uh, Turkey and, um, sorry, uh, Turkey and, and Iran tend to be sort of apostate regimes. So where does that leave? Well, there's Afghanistan, which is sort of the back of beyond, doesn't count much. And then you've got, uh, wasn't yet Saudi Arabia, but Saudi Arabia and Yemen, uh, more or less one territory. These are the only self-governing Muslim territories. So Osama bin Laden describes this. And this means the 1920s, the end of the First World War, is a key decade, probably the key decade in recent Muslim-Christian relations. Osama bin Laden describes this. Following World War, this is in his first videotape after the September 11, 2001 attacks. Following World War I, which ended more than 83 years ago, the whole Islamic world fell under the Crusader banner, under the British, and French, and Italian governments. They divided the whole world. So uh, that is, is how that is seen. And so you just had sort of effectively Saudi Arabia and maybe uh, Afghanistan. 
Uh, the Soviets, of course, invaded uh, Afghanistan in the uh, 1980s. And then um, after Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait down here on the uh, America and other allies want to remove from Ku Kuwait, and this meant stationing troops in Saudi Arabia. So, the only Muslim majority country on the face of the earth where infidel troops had not been. And then people arrived and said, We're from the American government, we're here to help. Uh, again, to quote uh, bin Laden on this score, um, he calls it the latest and greatest aggression. Now infidels walk on the land where Muhammad was born and where the Quran was revealed. Uh, in his writings, you see that it's got many grievances, but this is the key one. That infidels are in the Holy Land. And if you look from this perspective, you have that early expansion of the Muslim world. And then again, the contraction from Europe, from the areas we now call colonization, and then the collapse of the Middle East itself. If you happen to live here and you're looking around the world, the world is crashing in on you. You're getting focused. And then they're coming here. So this crushing um, sense of failure. It seems you've had 1,000 years of stunning success and 300 years of crushing failure. And particularly in the greater Middle East, on most of the sort of world tables, uh, economically, unless you have lots of oil, you're doing badly. In terms of democracy and government, you're doing badly. In terms of education work, attainment, you're doing badly. In, in cases of human rights, you're doing badly. Most of the tables you can sort of measure, you're doing badly, and there's the power of foreigners, and now you have internal dissent. So the question, for many Muslims, you're looking back on the 20th century, 1,000 years of success, 300 years of failure, why? What went wrong? What have we done wrong? And that question is still being wrestled with in many forms. You know, one is, well, we didn't learn from the West. Uh, that was very much the example of Ataturk in Turkey and, and quite a few others. And another one, very powerful now, is it's quite simple. We stopped being good Muslims. When we were good Muslims, we followed the way of the Prophet. We were successful. Remember that first map? We could conquer a world in 100 years. Uh, but now we've gone uh, chasing after foreign gods, uh, learning from the Christians, believing that science is a god, or education is a god, or there are things like feminism, or democracy, or philosophy, or things like that which we've been foisted off with, and they don't work. We need to re return to being good Muslims. Many definitions of what counts as a good Muslim, but groups we call Salafis, say it was the first generation, the first three or four generations of Muslims. Uh, that was the pure form we need, get, need to get back to that. And that's the sort of doctrine you, you find very powerfully in, um, in Saudi Arabia. And, um, but also you find it under, that's Al-Qaeda's view, and it's also um, ISIS's view. So you have, what you have is looking at a world. Um, at the moment, we have something like this. These little pockets, not much better than the rest of the world. They may be self-governing, but they're not really Islamic. Um, and so you want to call for that. Well, let's just go through those uh, slides. That's the areas at one time under Muslim rule that is from Hizbud al Tariya, what it says the future caliphate should be. Uh, Hizbud Tariya is to a large degree peaceful, but it's a movement which wants to reestablish the caliphate. That's, ISIS wants to do it too, but more violently. But Hizbud Tariya active throughout the world. Um, this is their map. And as you can see, I couldn't get them in the same format, but they're fundamentally identical. So what is, what is it you want to do? Well, we're stuck with this. How do we get back to that? And uh, there's very similar maps uh, produced by ISIS. 
I've got some on the slideshow, but it's hard to prove their provenance, uh, that it's actually an official ISIS map or whatever. Uh, but those, uh, they're very, very similar. So with this very brief, brief overview, um, what am I saying? There's a long pattern of conflict between the Christian world and the Muslim world. Not only that, we're talking about 1,300 years. People were trading across all of these things. Christians were finding Christians in alliance with Muslims and vice versa. Philosophers were talking and arguing with each other along this. It's not all a pattern of conflict. But we do see the sort of these shifting powers. And we do see, particularly in the Muslim world, uh, a remembrance of that, often a misremembrance and a distorted view of it, but not a not altogether stupid view that in the last 300 years, you guys have you know, taken over. We well, took over your old lands, that might be okay. You took over other people's, but then so did we, so we're both bad, but now you've taken over ours. And you know, what is the problem here? What do we do? And what you will find in violent groups, um, Al-Qaeda, Alaska Jihad, um, ISIS, and so on, is saying, we want to reclaim the caliphate. We want to reestablish the Muslim empire uh, with, they hope, one ruler. There's never been, really been one ruler before. That's the ideological driving goal. And this is against what they see as a tax on them by the Christian world. And hence, that's a reason for much of the virulence of attacks on the Christians. And is what we're seeing now an attempt to start the pendulum moving again or that expansion again? Very much it is. Um, I don't think it can be successful. But hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions of people, um, could die in its failure. So how can we respond to this situation? Uh, there are many aspects of a good response. But um, one form is, I'll just use the term very loosely, ideological. How do people think? What do people believe? It can be expressed in uh, many ways, but uh, two weeks ago I was having lunch with, in Indonesia with the president's, president of Indonesia's special envoy to the Middle East, who was talking about some of these problems. And, of course, he's far, he gets far more to the point than do American politicians who dance around them. He says, look, 15 years ago you were fighting al-Qaeda. He says, well, not only you, us as well, Indonesians as well. He says, now you're fighting ISIS. In 15 years you'll be fighting someone else. There'll be a different name, different organization. Same problem in different dress. Unless you deal with the ideology of what people believe, this will reappear in some form. How do we deal with it? And he said, so we need a reorientation in Islam. Obviously, this is a job for Muslims. I'm not going to listen to you very much. Um, he said, and this is where Indonesia can be important. And Indonesia, and this is my interest in this work of looking uh, to Indonesia. The country is not perfect by any means. Uh, very corrupt, all sorts of problems. Probably read that two, in Aceh, two churches were burnt down two weeks ago. Thousands of Christians flee, fled, though they have returned home. Uh, you get violence and you get bad things. But the dominant, the hegemonic form of Islam in Indonesia uh, is pluralist and peaceful in orientation. And one of the things I wanted to know was why, but first let's explore it a bit. It's always it's one of those countries which underperforms. You don't hear about it very much on the world um, stage, and it tends to be quite humble. But to reiterate the basic point, unless some of the dominant forms of Islam in the greater Middle East, from which I mean from Pakistan through to Morocco, change, we're going to be in conflict for quite a while. And why the interest in Indonesia? Firstly, it's by far the largest Muslim country in terms of population. It has a population of about uh, 270 million, of whom approximately 85% are Muslim. It's also the world's third largest democracy. It's had eight successful 
relatively free and fair elections. So it's a functioning Muslim democracy. It has the 10th largest economy in the world, depending on how you count, and it's, it's moving up the tables. And it has the largest economy in the Muslim world. So it's been expanding. It's now starting to sort of feel that it needs a bigger place on the world stage. Uh, the world in general, uh, but especially in the Muslim world. In, in Indonesia, you have lots of influences from the Arab world, particularly the Saudis, funding mosques, preachers, books, translations, and so on, uh, seeking to introduce or increase a more radical form of Islam. The Indonesians want to push back and also start to influence uh, other Muslim countries, and they already have programs doing that. So I'm interested in understanding the place and um, uh, helping, understanding that openness, helping protect it from more radical influences and increasing its influence elsewhere in the world. So here now, a just very impressionistic sense of some of the things which go on in Indonesia. I'm not going to try and explain the whole place. I could mention lots of bad things too. But there are certain things here that um, you often don't get elsewhere and could be more influential. So here's one element of Indonesia, sign in the store in Yogyakarta. This is traditional Javanese culture. There are no smoking signs there as well. But this, which you get elsewhere, but almost nowhere else will you get this. I mean, you don't contradict people. You don't criticize them. You don't tell them wrong, they're wrong. Oh, yeah. Smoking is good. But not smoking is better. This is a sign in the store. Uh, discussions of religions are like that. Usually you don't criticize another person's religion. That's, that gets people upset. But you can lift up your own. You can talk about, you can say, you know, you can talk about Jesus, no problem. Don't criticize Muhammad, or vice versa. Um, so there's a cultural underlay in Java, and Sumatra, and some other places. Uh, just some other uh, illustrations. Uh, Islamic school kids were seeking to uh, set up exchange programs for students to go to, from here to go live in Islamic boarding schools in Indonesia for two weeks. And if Baylor wants to come in as part of that, it would be um, quite fascinating. Anyway, they tend to be very cheerful. Um, most Indonesian Muslim women uh, have a head covering. They're called a jilbab. Uh, not many of them are black. Pink, yellow, green. Stars and stripes is unusual, but um, that's was real. She said I could use the... Uh, Use the photo in the slideshow. You prob it didn't extend for publicity beyond this, so it shouldn't be used generally. But I mean, for these purposes, uh, that's OK. So you get that sort of thing. You don't find that in the Middle East. She's actually, um, this is a mosque, one of the oldest mosques in Java, soon an ample after one of the um, Muslim apostles. Uh, you can see, well, you probably don't know, it's traditional Javanese style, but it is those, those three roofs forming like a mountain. That's a traditional Javanese pattern. You'll see it in Hindu temples and elsewhere. <coughs> and usually this place has a minaret. The older mosques didn't have minarets. The newer ones generally don't either. They used, a, they used and still use a large drum called a badug. That's how you announce the call to prayer. You'll hear the drums. Um, in, there's more minarets in, the, in new cities, but uh, someone decided they wanted a minaret, but they didn't want to imitate the Middle East. So someone had seen a lighthouse somewhere, I don't know, North Carolina. So that's, uh, that's a minaret which can also function as a lighthouse. There's a playful element. Uh, this is the mosque. Okay, in another town, I, I didn't bring the photograph of the Sun Tzu Mosque which uh, also exists in, in Surabaya. But this is the mosque. There's a, that's inside the mosque. This is the famous Chinese admiral who sailed the seas. In Indonesia, he's regarded as a Muslim apostle here. He's to have an Islamic scroll. He's going over from China here, symbolized there. 
over to Indonesia, doing many things, but also uh, bringing Islam. Uh, much of Islam in Indonesia was spread by people from uh, China. But also you see a portrayal of a human being inside a mosque, and there are others. Uh, this is a mosque. I have no idea of its history, or uh, there was nobody around when I went there. Um, I just assumed someone had been to Moscow, say Basel <laughs> Cathedral, or seen a postcard or something, and says, wow, that would make a really good mosque. <laughs> so a um, few other things. This is uh, in August. I was invited to the Congress held every five years by Nadlatul Ulama, uh, which is the world's largest Muslim organization. It has about 50 million followers. That is, it has more followers than any country in the Middle East, any Arab country, has people except Egypt. So it's quite big. Uh, this was great fun. There were 2,000 delegates having meetings and elections and boring things there, but there were tens of thousands of other people um, wandering around. You can see the big sound stage. You get your foot massage. There's lots of food. You could buy books. You could buy blankets. You could buy. I bought. Uh, I have a combination cigarette lighter, a bottle opener, emblazoned with the symbol of Nadatul Ulama. And you don't get those from the Episcopalians. So, <laughs> so this, I, I wrote a piece about it uh, that can be distributed. The atmosphere of the surrounding thing, I could compare to American State Fair. Except more polite, I mean, there's no booze around. Um, but, you know, Toyota has a booth, Honda has a booth, there are art exhibitions, art galleries. You can sign up for their books, look at magazines. They've got 22 universities, so you can uh, check those out. They have about 14,000 schools. You can check the uh, brochures of those things. So, and this is a huge event in Indonesia. The president of the country opened it. Lead item on news, uh, front page newspapers above the fold every day. Big occasion. And uh, ambassadors gave greetings on the opening day and, the, and then went. For the rest of this occasion, there were two very distinguished academics, students of Indonesian Islam present, uh, talking about Westerns, them and me. And one of my, the point of the article is this. This is the world's largest Muslim organization. So except for a couple of professors, there's one Westerner who's visiting. Shouldn't there be rather more journalists here? Or people just, just spend four days there, you know, eat, eat hamburgers, get a foot massage, and uh, check whatever else is, is going on. And um, your view of, your intuitive view of Islam would change. This isn't to deny that ISIS exists or the Saudis do these bad things and so on. But you, you're just getting this very interesting um, culture. How did I get involved in this? Through this man, Abdul Ram Wahid, he was the former president of, of Nadatul Ulama, the organization I just mentioned, and also former president of Indonesia. And I, uh, I and one of my colleagues uh, wrote a book a couple of years ago um, dealing with blasphemy and apostasy around the world, or restrictions on blasphemy and apostasy and their effects, largely in the Muslim world. And um, through a mutual friend, uh, Abdul Ram Wahid agreed to write and, and wrote the foreword to that book. I said, do you want to do that? Have you read the section on Indonesia? It's not critical. I said, we've got to read this book. So he wrote a foreword called God Needs No Defense, which is now quite a famous work in its own right, and is also a rap song in Indonesia. So Wahid, Wahid is now dead, but uh, uh, quite an amazing uh, man. One other Indonesian figure um, is uh, this gentleman on the left. Uh, he's a governor. He's the governor of Jakarta. He is the only sitting governor I have ever heard quote John Calvin and Abraham Kuyper as major influences on how he approaches governing. I've heard ex-governors 
and pre-governors in this country do that, but never actually while they were in office. Uh, but this gentleman, very committed Christian, Calvinist, is the governor of Jakarta, the capital city of Indonesia. He's a Christian. So he'll probably get reelected. He's quite, he's a, quite an amazing uh, person. And uh, he's, he's head of the municipal uh, part of Jakarta, which is about 10 million people. The, the whole Kana Basin is about 28 million, which would mean that Kana Basin is the largest Muslim majority city uh, in the world. And at least he's, he's the governor of the central part of it. So, and uh, he's fun. You should get him over here. A couple of other illustrations. All this is sort of the wonderful thing, but through the Ministry of Religious Affairs, which also hosted a reception on that book about apostasy, which I mentioned. And the, the then Minister of Religious Affairs has written the foreword to the Indonesian translation. Sorry, this is talking about a lot of my things, but I'm trying to give you a sense of some of the amazing things which go on in this place. Um, this is, it's a state university, but functionally it's very Islamic because of demography. I mean, the, we did a one-day conference. It was open with Quranic readings, Quranic prayers, and so on. It would be about 5% Christian. Um, but this was on, on religious freedom. And these are all teachers, 600 of them, in, in Surabaya. And some have different things, but spend the morning in the session. In the afternoon, 200 of them have to prepare lesson plans on religious freedom, which are, we're then going to go over and discuss. So. At, this is a state university. These will be teachers in, in, in state schools. That's a group of them afterwards being very cheerful because the lectures are uh, over. <laughs> Another one, this is just two weeks ago, we had a, uh, a seminar in Jakarta, the traditional capital. And we brought some American philanthropists over to Indonesia hoping that they will fund uh, projects, particularly intellectual projects, um, over the, the of, I'll just mention these four. Uh, Roma Magnus, he is a, a very senior Jesuit uh, philosopher. Uh, Shafi Marif was from 1995 to 2005 the, the head of Muhammadiyah, the world's second largest Muslim organization with about 40 million followers. He has a strong background as a radical, which um, he, he changed from, there's now a new biography of him out and actually a play about his life. He was changed largely in, in Chicago. He was a student of Fazlur Rahman, if any of you know him. Maybe the leading Muslim scholar within uh, the United States in the last, uh, last part of the 20th century. So Shafi gave a paper, Amin Abdullah uh, gave a paper. He was the rector of the Islamic State University there. And um, so a very open round table discussion. Just picking on these two again, Shafi Marif. We have, hope to have him coming over to give lectures in uh, the US and Europe next year. So it's a thing we might want to tie, if you want to tie Baylor in. Uh, this man is the Sultan of Jakarta. Jakarta is like a state, called a province. He's the Sultan. Um, his name is Hamanka Bawono the Tenth. his father being the ninth, and so on. He's also the governor of the state. It's hereditary. His, because his dad was governor, he was governor, his granddad was governor. And there's a question, this is the only Indonesian thing, all the other governors are elected. This was, traditional pattern has continued for 300 years. They had a referendum on should we abolish that and go to electing governors, and the referendum was overwhelmingly defeated. It's as if, you're asking us, do we want the royal family or a bunch of politicians running our lives? We'll go for the royal family every time. <laughs> this is a pretty good royal family. Uh, but the Sultan chaired that round table, about 30 of us there, and also gave a paper in it dealing with religious toleration and openness, and then hosted the group in a state dinner that evening. And um, he has donated land in Jakarta, the traditional capital, to deal with interfaith relations. 
And um, twice during that dinner, he mentioned that, that he wanted to do work on that. And since he's Javanese, remember the beginning, Javanese, smoking is good. If you, someone mentions it, something twice, they're hitting you over the head with a club, you know, <laughs> shouting at you, uh, that he wants to work on these issues probably with us. So that's a thing we're seeking to explore in the, uh, in the coming year. Just how are we doing? Just um, one more um, anecdote in four parts. Uh, this is a this is a mosque just by the side of the road in uh, in West, uh, no, sorry, in Ambon, in Maluku province, an area where there was tremendous violence 14 years ago. Over 10,000 people died in religious conflict. Uh, so let's just look at that mosque. Here is a picture taken earlier, which we managed to rescue. Um, it's hard to get it, but there's sort of, you can see the bamboo. There's a huge bamboo ramp going from the street here to the roof of the mosque. I would personally not have liked to have tried to walk up that. But all these people are. And what they're doing is taking the, the crescent, which will be placed on top of the mosque, carrying that up the ramp. It will be passed from a Muslim to a Christian, to a Muslim to a Christian. And the person who will place the crescent on the mosque will be a Christian. In the same area, next village over, in building a church, a Muslim will place the cross on top of the church. And this is not that uncommon in Indonesia. The more uncommon thing was the island of Alor, where they did something similar. And each group, as thanks, asked the other to name the building. So in Alor, we have the Emmanuel Mosque, <laughs> right next to the Ishmael Church. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. In uh, this case, it didn't, but I, um, that's because these two, two villages, a Muslim and now a Christian village, um, have a covenant which they maintain goes back to 1503 which must be before the Christian village was, was Christian. And um, the Muslims had rescued people from the other village from drowning. There's more background in this. And uh, because of that, the two villages, uh, Bumitera and, and Posse, made a covenant. And that covenant had three parts. We will not make war on each other. We will help each other and we will not intermarry. Interesting. My way of putting it is, we're not postmodern relativists who, you know, going back, uh, um, they're saying, it's not, we don't think there's any difference between us. No, we're not going to have our kids marry each other. They're Christians, we're Muslims, vice versa. That doesn't mean we have to kill each other. And the uh, Raja of the, uh, Muslim village. Um, here he's dressed in uh, official robe. Uh, he is in his house dressed in his non-official robe. Um, uh, we've gathered to uh, discuss some of these things and I'll finish with this. Uh, and that mosque is, is right by his place. But he expressed the form of that covenant in a slightly different, even more powerful way. After three hours of discussion, he said, you know, the Muslims here are fanatics. We were wondering, you know, you start to get nervous then. And it seems strange, because we've been there for three hours drinking tea with everybody walking. And then he said, the Christians here are fanatics. But we all believe we should love each other. I take it what he meant by fanatic, we're being, you know, being translated here is, we're real Muslims. We're not wishy-washy, half-hearted, you know, we haven't all read Clifford Geertz on Javanese religion. Uh, we're really believing, practicing, solid Muslims. And they're really believing, practicing Christians. We're not a bunch of syncretists. But each of us believes we're called to love the other. Could give other examples in Indonesia. And again, I want to emphasize that it's not all like this. Bad things are going on. But you see all these currents going on. And very widespread, and a lot of theologians discussing why. Uh, what factors 
develop this. The pre-existing cultures, the way Islam comes to the country, the geography of the country, they all live on the coast, so everybody's always interacting with different people. They're very pluralist. Uh, but now Indonesia, both these organizations I mentioned, Narutul Ulama, it's working in southern Thailand where there's conflict. It's actually doing stuff in Pakistan, Afghanistan. Uh, the Indonesian government is now trying to start exporting its own variety of Islam. It's ex opening schools in other parts of the world, bringing students in. So my interest is to understand this in greater depth, to expose more people to it, and to see whether Indonesian Islam can have much more influence in the Muslim world. Uh, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm not a Muslim. Um, but I'm very committed to replacing Muslims who want to kill us with Muslims who want to have dinner with us. <laughs> so, and that's part of what this is. And then we can talk about these matters. So, Indonesia is not the full answer. It's not the only answer. It's a very partial thing. But I think the influence of forms of Islam like this uh, is a key to reducing, at some point perhaps ending, the sorts of conflicts and back and forth we began with at the beginning. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Please feel free to ask questions. Lady here. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering um, what kind of school of thought is um, predominant in Indonesia and what, whether or not these people, the government, um, who's deciding, who, who want to play a role in, um, mm -hmm. in uh, moderating the Islamic world, if they have considered that. Say that last part again. Yeah, if they've considered that, well, I'm, I'm one school of thought and there are other schools of thought, mm -hmm. so, I, you know, so I need to be considerate of that when I'm talking to yeah, I mean, they're, they're very aware of this. This is just an um, outlay of, in, in terms of the schools of Sharia law, mm -hmm. uh, the various ones, you can see Indonesia is Shafi. That's the, uh, the dominant form there. So in, in terms of interpretations uh, of Islamic law, uh, that's where they tend to fall. There's a lot of commonality, again, with, with East Africa and uh, Yemen. So... Um, they're aware of that, but I would also say that um, some of the key questions about the nature of Islam uh, go far beyond the questions of Islamic law, in that, for an outsider at least, many of these schools are very similar. I mean, you can go to mosque in Cairo and they'll be teaching all four of them simultaneously in four classrooms, and you can take your pick. Um, but the questions come up is, how do we relate to pre-existing cultures? A uh, big discussion in Indonesia where they have sought to be enculturated you know, from the shape of the mosque to using drums and other things. We want to understand and take good things from uh, cultures. So now questions come up of common grace. I'm mean, going to use Christian terms. You know, common grace, natural law, these sorts of things um, of how do we deal with existing cultures. Now, different questions of that kind don't come up in the different schools of Islamic law. They can appear like, in all of them. So um, then questions of Quranic interpretation. You know, is there, can you have a historical dimension in, in understanding the Quran and how you do that? So uh, they're aware of those things. And they're strongly aware of the differences because they're getting faced with a lot of the conflicts in the Middle East being imported there. Uh, with Saudi uh, and other money. And they resist, actually resisted that for centuries, literally. Um, so yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they're very much aware of this. And the tendency, I mean, I don't want to um, keep saying negative things about the Arab world, but there's a tendency, other Muslims will tell you this, that Arabs say, well, we, you speak Arabic, the language of the Quran and everything else. We're the true Muslims, you know, you're a bunch of syncretists and not real, and you need to be purified. So big stress on the purification of Islam coming out of much of the Middle East. And Indonesians now um, resisting that. I mean, their position right now is, we're doing pretty well. 
<laughs> we got problems. Uh, but we're a functioning uh, democracy. We don't have a civil war, even though we've got 700 different language groups on these islands. Uh, our religious relations are pretty peaceful. And we actually don't think that the people who live here have many lessons to teach us about you know, how to run the world or society. So um, they very much want to teach what they're getting and saying, the stuff we're getting from the Middle East, look, you guys are in civil war and repression and everything else. You have to start asking questions about uh, what it is uh, you believe in and the versions of Islam you have. Sorry, that was too long an answer, but yep. I just had a question. You mentioned that Indonesia might be a good model for a moderate pluralistic form of Islam, mm -hmm. uh, Islamic governance, and you said that it was maybe something that could be influential. I was wondering if you thought that was more of a Southeast Asian phenomenon or something that could be more global. I know, obviously, the Saudis are effective in promoting their version of Islam using lots of money mm -hmm. in places like Jordan and Ethiopia. Um, I just wasn't really sure what you yeah, you could also include probably the best answer to your question. Um, how much can you export it? Well, one thing comes up that um, in areas of a Hindu background, which includes a large chunk of Pakistan, some of the substrata are there. I was talking to the British ambassador to Indonesia, who's a, Pak he's a Muslim of Pakistani background. And he was the one who said, well, he didn't think we could do anything in the Middle East. But he said, you know, the subcontinent in India, which, and India has similar forms of Islam. He says, well, in Pakistan, other places, I think that could happen. In Southeast Asia, I mean, Malaysia's having increasing problems. You need to do that. Southern Thailand, again. So I think that could happen in that area. But you also mentioned, well, and there may be geographical and sociological reasons why Islam grows up this way. But that's not destiny. You, know, you, can, you can learn things because of where you live. But that doesn't mean that what you live, what you know, only applies here. So you can export that. So the thinking about that a lot. Many of these guys studied in Saudi or at Al Azhar, in, um, in in Egypt. So, and as you mentioned, the Saudis seem to be able to uh, put a very austere version of Islam in parts of the world where, like Indonesia, you know, which are not at all. Uh, inhospitable. There were Wahhabis pushing in um, Indonesia in the late 1700s. The Indonesians told them to stop and they didn't, so they killed them. <coughs> so that we, that's not a very good analogy to use for what the Indonesians do elsewhere. But the point is, these things are getting exported and shifted all the time. And there is enough disenchantment with Islam uh, by many people in the Middle East because of what they see going on around them. You know, many becoming atheists, many becoming Christians. Uh, but also, uh, for those that don't want to do that, um, seeing other forms of Islam, I think, I think the possibility is there. We're not going to change the world tomorrow, but I think we can improve things. Also from Indonesia, mm -hmm. and I have been here for four years now. Never forget to Indonesia. So listening your presentation is quite good. Thank like you. Seeing my country, pluralism in Indonesia is not only in terms of religion, but also in terms of ethnicity. Mm -hmm. uh, and the tension also is not about religion only, but also about ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Can you comment about that one, for example? Yep. Like, 98, when you move to Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. right, Indonesia has revolution also, economic mm -hmm. crisis, and many bad things happen also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's a few things. Going back to 98, this is when Suharto is, is deposed. And you had quite a chaotic situation. You had attacks on uh, Chinese throughout a lot of, uh, of Java. Uh, you had the uh, violence in Maluku, also in, in central Sulawesi with that. Um, that sort of, and could the country fall apart? Because it has, depends how you count them, but take the lower 700 sort of functioning languages and different ethnic groups. Indonesian is the 
at home language for only about 10% of the population, I think. Almost everybody speaks it, but at home you speak Javanese or Sundanese or Batak. Or, um, so it's a country made to fly apart with different ethnicities, different, and it hasn't. So you've had no major violence. It was killing some posts again in 2005. But since 2002, you have not had these sort of major episodes of violence. You get heavy repression in Papua New Guinea, which has to do with a lot of the use of land. So yeah, you do get these tensions. When I was in, in Ambon, Maluku, there was conflict between two villages. And I asked uh, people I trusted on, in relation to both of them. I said, is this a religious thing? And I said, no. It's, it's a basically ethnic thing, and it's around land. So yeah, there's the ethnic problem. The fact that Indonesia's managed to hang together uh, is quite amazing, especially as according to all the development people handling transitions, it did everything wrong. Um, but so far, at least, for 17 years, it's, it's largely um, succeeded. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of ethnic division, lots of division of, of all kinds. But um, the violence of the first four years after Suharto is out seemed to have stayed in that period, and they're finding their way out. So now questions of corruption are a you know, much bigger problem for the future of the country. Maybe one more question. OK. Um, so how, should a, how could a student get involved um, in seeing the cultural change that's going on, or the cultural uh, phenomenon that's going on in Indonesia? And how can we learn to bring that to our own country um, that is struggling with these issues of religious pluralism? <coughs> yeah. The, uh, to be a student, one way might be you know, to go and study there for a year. Try to think, can you do that in English? Probably in John Jakarta you could. There's a three-university consortium which has a sort of institute for studies of religion. Uh, the, so, but you know, spend a time, uh, spend a term or something. Uh, that's one thing you can sort of do on your own or with the university's permission, something like that. We're seeking to set up a, an exchange program. Now, this is with these Pesantren is Islamic high schools and lower universities. Um, so that would be more junior undergraduates. For people to go and just go and live in one of those for two or three weeks, uh, that's one thing we're looking at. Um, another one is to uh, looking at, at some conferences arranged with the Sultan, but to bring some uh, Indonesians, uh, senior uh, Indonesian usually Muslim figures, you can bring Christians too, um, over here to lecture and to meet people. Uh, also looking at translation programs. Apart from students, uh, see if we can set up a pattern where we bring faculty um, over there. You, you get people coming, McGill University in Montreal, uh, Boston, a university has program, uh, their professors go over, but not many. Uh, relations are still quite, uh, at a very beginning level. So uh, certainly you could, you could, you know, if you can find the money you can get over there on your own. <coughs> and hopefully we'll have some programs uh, to make that easier. Join me in thanking Paul Martin.